Hi everyone, welcome back to the Genetic Genius Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lulu. And on this week's episode, Andrea Caprio discusses how to create and find a relationship with food that embraces freedom in every aspect of our life. Andrea is an emotional eating expert and master certified transformational nutrition coach. She helps business professionals to take their power back from overeating with her proven tools and lifestyle hacks. Founder and CEO of Wellness Methods, she's also passionate about living life to the fullest, but in a healthy way. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Genetic Genius Podcast. I'm so thrilled to have Andrea Caprio as my guest today. We're going to be diving deep into food and how to find your freedom, which is one of my favorite topics. Of course, I love food <laughs> and I love being free with it. So welcome. <laughs> Dr. Lulu, thank you so much for having me and welcome everybody here. I am passionate about food too, and I like really food, but the healthy way. And I don't think any to deprive of food and that's what I want to share today yes I love that and we're going to be diving deep into that conversation and so before we get started I'd love for you to just introduce yourself Andrea to the audience and talk about yourself where you what's your passion obviously food is part of it but what's been your journey to get you to this place in time Mm. I love sharing this because so many years ago, before uh, becoming a master certified transformational nutrition coach, I was on my own journey. And I thought I was eating actually quite healthy, but I realized I was eating far too much sugar. There was mm. a bit of sugar in my tea and my coffee. There was a biscuit here, some cereal in the morning and so on. And I add, it added up and realizing that one day, I especially realized how much the sugar actually affected my health. I had mm. bloating. I had weekly migraines. I was always tired. I had weight issues. I had some hormonal issues. Even several fibroids had to be removed because they regrew all the time. And it was just like going on and on. I had acne and so on. And I came at that time across a very healthy detox. It was really nourishing the body, getting rid of toxins. And when I did that, literally everything changed in my life. I had no more bloating, I had energy, I was not tired anymore, I eventually lost weight, I never had to anymore remove those fibroids because they didn't grow, and instead of having weekly migraines, I have now three, four times per, perhaps a year only. So literally my whole health improved, and when I saw that, I said, hey, that's really amazing, chest nutrition, perhaps a little bit of lifestyle and so on, just nourishing my body with the right foods that felt good. I really felt good about myself. And at that time, I came actually across an ad on Facebook, like it is when you Google something mm -hmm. about a nutrition school. I researched 60 different nutrition schools and I decided for one, which was the best decision ever, because it provided a very holistic approach actually to health. So not only the science of nutrition, but also combined, and I know you understand that with it, emotional, mm. spiritual, the whole holistic approach, which I think is so important for overall health. And I started then, I started, I actually did eventually my master certification there with some specializations in gut health, in hormonal health, autoimmune weight loss as well, emotional eating. And when I started working with my clients, I really realized that most of my clients had weight issues and cravings, emotional eating issues, combined often with some other chronic illnesses, often started with the lifestyle changes from a genetic predisposition. And realizing that I really wanted to help them. And mm. that's what I do today. I love that. But it's so important when you have the piece of discovering for yourself, it's something that you were working on with yourself and you can relate so much at a deeper level with our patients, our clients, when we have that particular relationship and oh yeah, I share that with you. That's that empathy and sympathy. And it's just, I love that you went that holistic nutrition path, which I think, like you said, is all about the whole body, right? We can't leave, especially when it comes to food. We have to address the physical, the emotional piece for sure. And we're going to be talking about that a lot today, <clears throat> which I am so excited for us to talk about. And let's, so let's dive into talking about food. <laughs> so for, if you're tuning mm. in, we're talking all about food freedom today. So I would love for you to talk about what that concept means. First of all, like, what do you mean with food freedom? Cause I think that people might not even understand that word. What does that mean? <laughs> 
True. And that was a big discussion we had. And I loved having you at my summit, actually, Yay, a couple of yes. months ago, which mm -hmm. was called the Food Freedom Festival, where we explored. And basically, the food freedom for me means that people are actually getting a better relationship with food and are not anymore having the thoughts around food all the time, like the overwhelm. So many people are overwhelmed. What should I eat? What can I eat? What can't I eat? No matter if it's on Google, on Facebook, or friends who say, oh, you should follow that diet or this. A lot of my clients who come and see me, they have done diet after diet, yo-yo dieting. That's not the answer because they are overly concerned about the diet and it's actually not the diet. The diet leads to yo-yo dieting mm -hmm. and breaking free from that is for me food freedom right finding out what works for you we all are different you're different from me from the listeners here so we all need a different approach as well and mm. that again is for me food freedom finding this personalized nutrition and that might be a certain type of diet let's say keto or paleo but it might be something completely different and then having a better relationship with themselves with oneself i think is also what is food freedom so feeling more confident mm. not any more worrying if you have maybe one pound more or less or if you eat this <laughs> or that but just feeling good in yourself and all these things for me are really the what i call food freedom yeah and that's so important i think what you that really key Key point of individualization when it comes to food. Not one size fits all. And that's totally true when it comes to food. And that's that the genetic piece too. We each, our body needs something individualized and it's how we thrive on that. For me, I really thrive when I'm eating raw foods and light foods because I burn through energy so fast. And if I have heavy foods, it just makes me want to take a nap. And I've totally discovered that in the winter, I do a little bit of heavier foods because that those grounding foods, but so individualized. And I love that piece and how you mentioned as well is that it's really about finding your own individualized freedom, right? What makes you feel the best and supports you, makes you thrive. And we're going to dive into that a little even deeper. So let's talk about the relationship with food. And I want to dive into about our early childhood. And when do we find that relationships that we create with food at that early age, do they shape our relationship that we have with food as adults? I like to use always one thing and people usually say, oh, wow, I haven't seen that yet. When we are born, immediately, usually we are put to the breast of our mother and we are breastfed and the milk, like the breast milk is mm -hmm. sweet. It's milk sugar plus a lot of other things, of course. And even if it would not be the breast milk, it's the same with formula just, but let's say the normal thing is, and our ancestors and so on, we have been conditioned to want this breast milk. Mm -hmm. And basically it, because of the sweetness of it, it creates a craving right? Because in the end, that is what makes us survive as a baby, because mm -hmm. we suddenly out of the womb, and we are there and we need to eat, otherwise, right. we're gonna die. <laughs> so the nature has put this craving mechanism right in there. So as a baby, we crave the mother milk, making us eat or drink rather, depending how you want to say that it conditions us to crave sweet things mm. and to crave food. And I find that I learned that not too long ago, I must say. I, I kind of knew it, but through, through studying it, but I really realized this importance of it. And understanding this makes us understand how the food industry developed probably as well, because in right. the end, the food industry does exactly the same thing, just maybe not for the same I mean, same, same method. <laughs> a, exactly. They have another idea here. Yes. But in the end, that's also, and that's why I think it's so difficult for people to stop eating the foods they crave, mm. which in general are sweet foods or carbohydrate rich foods, right? Mm. Be salty. But in the end, even if the carbohydrate rich foods such as bread or pizza, they also break down to glucose, which goes back to the same milk sugar it's not the same right. milk sugar but the Similar. reaction in our right. body right yeah <laughs> seen by our body as glucose and when you understand that that makes us really see why we crave and why the relationship with food is actually often right from the beginning not the best yeah oh that's great and what a great connection because i think there's so many pieces that we learn in that beginning phase of being a newborn being a toddler and what about when you're in 
like for instance, the standard American diet that most of Americans are fed as children, how does that then shift that same relationship? So does that sugar pattern most of the time continue if you're already in that same sugar pattern and create those different food cravings as a teenager and adult? Of course, yes, that is then just a continuation that one, we see, of course, our parents or our family or people around us eating a certain way. So we just copy that. <laughs> Often it is also in families. I'm sure we all have some sort of things. I work a lot with my clients on limiting beliefs, right? Mm -hmm. Example, we have a limiting or false belief. We are not valuable or we're not loved. As a sample, let's say you have this little child at home, parents come home, they're tired, then maybe just want a break because they work the whole day they put the child in front of tv with a big box of chips or with cookies whatever. or candy right yeah <laughs> absolutely and the child basically thinks the parents don't love me and only the cookies love me there of course then later in life the love is associated with those cookies and often when then you know, now uh, somebody comes maybe to see me or see you or whoever it is, we say, oh, stop eating the cookies. Suddenly the world breaks down for that right. person. Yeah, they have no course. love anymore. Wait a minute, what happened? <laughs> yeah. And that's also the part really I find so important and I work with my clients really deep on is to find out this root cause actually in terms of, so I'm working very much with root cause physical and mm. also the emotional side mm. and finding that for example that example i mentioned is then once we realize that we can then work on it and overcome of course those limiting beliefs the initial thought of it whenever that happens work maybe on a trauma often mm -hmm. people had some trauma and then overcome those cravings for those cookies whenever we feel sad or unloved or whatever. a great connection and i like how you brought in that piece of trauma because there's a lot of people have a relationship with food and i love your example of sitting the child in front of the TV was so common. Now it's even because we have cell phones and iPads everywhere that the family goes. I'll go out to eat at a restaurant and everyone at the table has their, their phone out. And even the, like the children that are four or five years old. And you're just thinking, wow, what kind of relationship is that creating? There's no communication at the table. There's no relationship with the food. And I think that hopefully that will begin to change as more people realize how detrimental that is at a family with the family. And I understand the energy part of it, right? You're tired. Maybe you don't have the energy, but that's the piece that really needs to be shifted is how you can spend more time with the family members instead of giving them something, food or a device to appease is the word I'm looking for. Yeah. Appease Absolutely. the child. Yeah. Absolutely, because to go back to your initial question was how children grow up with a SAD, it's definitely because of this, like you said, like we are there with our phones, we eat mm -hmm. quickly, we don't mm -hmm. eat mindfully. And children just copying that is just they continue that obviously later on. And then on the other hand, they are all that comes from out. They can be different. One could be, oh, but you need to eat your plate. You need to finish your plate. So right. mm -hmm. children are immediately taught to overeat, even though they might be full. No, before eating the dessert, you need to finish what's on your plate. <laughs> uh, very often right. we've been told that. Or on the other hand, just cop copying unhealthy food and not being fulfilled really, or then maybe having, seeing your mother dieting quite strongly and then mm. having a wrong relationship with food and getting in this whole dieting cycle as well. I have a lot of clients or being bullied at school for being too fat, overweight, whatever it is. Mm. And then again, this bad body image comes in there. So this is all these things which obviously play a role and then go into the adulthood in a not so healthy relationship with food. Mm, exactly. And I think you brought up a good piece about that, that teenage years, which are a lot of women, especially it's not as common in men for that eating disorder to develop because of whether that is from a childhood experience, or like you said, where they were bullied in school, they want to have that particular body image. And you were mentioning the limiting belief concept earlier. And is that piece that really needs to be shifted when it comes to an eating disorder? And how does that shape the relationship with food further on for that individual? I don't think always that it's only eating disorders that have this limiting belief, by the yeah. way. I think it's right. in general. <laughs> yeah. Because so many people might develop a severe eating disorder, but some might just crave a little bit, emotional eating a little mm. bit, but some might also go in other coping mechanisms. And 
So very often that comes, of course, from this limiting or false belief of not being by valuable quite honestly i believe we all have some sort of these beliefs mm, i haven't met right. anybody who's not struggled at certain times of their right. lives they're human thinking they're not <laughs> lovable worthy successful whatever i mean i had it i guess you had your fair share as well but it's in the end then how we deal with it and the first step is recognizing it mm. what is it like I had a very difficult relationship with my dad. It was a non-existing relationship, actually. Mm. And so I felt not loved, right? Not lovable, not worthy. I, not, I felt I was not good enough to be loved. Yes, it made me work extra hard and being successful in many of um, my businesses and so on. But on the other hand, I feel stressed sometimes. But I had in the past, I've definitely used food to overcome that stress. <clears throat> I recognized it. And today I must say it's very seldom that I would use food to overcome any stress or any emotions mm. because I've really done the work. So it works. And I want to say it is possible really. But I have to be careful, for example, with my stress levels. They can go right. quite <laughs> high quite quickly. If I'm not paying attention to have, for example, my routine. So I'm a very habit-driven person. I believe that takes a lot out of trying to make willpower work. I don't believe in willpower. So just by sticking to a routine, for example, is something how I deal with those things and overcome any kind of reaction to stress, for example, or to emotion. Yeah. And I think you brought up some really valid points there. Having one, being able to identify what is your trigger. So if stress is your trigger for me, that's a definitely a big one if I'm more stressed out. And I don't actually, my go-to is to not eat when I'm really stressed out. And then I'll go and eat like way more than I should because I'll be busy, stressed. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, I haven't yeah. eaten for six hours. And then I'll have this massive amount of food or eat something that's not really like in tune with my body. And I think the other piece that you were talking about too is that listening, really tuning in to when you know your trigger, whether that's stress or some other piece and what what does that look like? I really so value that you brought that up and let's talk about, so you have an amazing five-step process for finding food, food freedom. <laughs> That's like the three F's mm -hmm. finding food freedom. I love for you to walk us through what that five-step process looks like. Okay, great question. Thank you. So it's called actually the food freedom formula. So finding food freedom formula. No, <laughs> yes. that's too much now of F's, <laughs> right. but yeah. uh, just joking. Okay, that's my five steps process. And I have developed that mainly over years working with hundreds and hundreds of clients and seeing that they were always struggling with certain areas to find mm. that food freedom, to get cravings free, to reach their health mm -hmm. or weight goals or whatever it is. And I believe those five steps work together, right? So each step on its own will probably bring some results, but in order to really reach your goals and to basically go through a transformation and permanently live that, embody that new lifestyle and being that new person you want to become is really important. They all work together. So the first step is to recognize your the root cause of your issues. We mm. talked a little bit already earlier. So can be, of course, physical or biochemical. It can be emotional or spiritual. But first of all, getting clear what the root cause is. Right. I have in my, my practice, I have a really thorough health assessment form, which helps me with this. And obviously speaking with my clients and so on. So we are looking, for example, is the root cause gut issue? Maybe a hormonal imbalance is maybe under that another root cause such as food intolerance. But then I would ask, okay, but why does that person suddenly have a food intolerance? Oh, it might be because they were born without being breastfed and they didn't get all those good things and develop maybe from that. Or it might be that it, it is genetically somehow there is some genetics and I always say that a genetics load the gun and the environment pulls the trigger. Maybe there was a trigger event right like a trauma right. that triggered that or so so we are always looking in that one so once you have found that root cause the next step is actually to reset your body's healing abilities so when the body over years as we age and as we live our life it gets stuck and the biggest detox organ is your liver exactly. most important not the biggest right. your skin but uh, <laughs> yes right, i know what you meant the most important <laughs> 
the most important. I've always to be careful. And when the liver eventually get a little bit overloaded or so it gets stuck. And you can imagine that like the pipe in your house, if there's, if the pipe in your house doesn't work anymore, something is stuck, nothing works back and forward. And that's often what happens in the liver and the digestive system around. And that's why often actually people maybe do the right thing, but they're not losing weight or they're not mm. getting healthy because the liver just is stuck there. And really healthy detox, that's actually the one which made me become a nutrition coach and initially go there is what I then use with my clients actually to allow the liver to get into flow and also nourish the body. Once that is done, we can then actually to repair the root causes because then the body is in flow and whatever we do to repair the gut, to repair the hormonal system or whatever else needs repairing is then able to actually work. And remember things like Sometimes to achieve our goals, let's say weight loss, for example, we need first to address other areas of our body. If the body is, for example, high in inflammation, the body will hold on to the fat to protect itself. And that's also one of the reasons, by the way, why sometimes people are at the weight mm. loss plateau. And then the fourth step for me is something I'm really passionate about is to relearn healthy habits. Mm. Now, often, and we spoke a little bit about, you know, childhood, teenage, and then adulthood, how is it with all those eating habits? Often we have forgotten, or maybe we learned them, not really, or whatever it is, those important habits like sleep, like stress, like mindful eating, like making sure that you have three meals. Like you said earlier, if you don't eat for several hours, like six hours, because you're so stressed, then you overeat, right? Mm -hmm. So eating regularly and all these kind of things, exercising is obviously something we want to learn. And what I do there is I believe a lot of people struggle when they do a new thing, a new diet or whatever yeah. new way do too much and right. they get overwhelmed the fall off the wall. they don't okay. do it so I start with tiny habits a really great book by the way by the same name and starting very small habits just to implement those maybe just one minute meditation instead of one right. hour an right? hour <laughs> five minutes exercise every day instead of like a half an hour exercise or just adding one vegetable to your meals or so because in the end you can when you just do that you can eventually crave vegetables instead of the sugar by the way that's a true thing as well and so I really, I'm very passionate about habits and you can imagine it or you can compare it to brushing your teeth. You don't, you brush your teeth in the morning and the evening. And I'm asking this, all the listeners here, right? right? Yes. Are you brushing right. your teeth That's in a the good morning habit. and the evening? You will <laughs> Make sure you're doing hopefully it. say, <laughs> asking <up. laughs> you, but now I'm asking you, do you think about it? And you say, no, you just do it. And that's exactly the same way we want to learn other habits because then we don't need willpower anymore, which doesn't exist really and then the last one and that's probably the one I'm most passionate and we've talked again about it a lot is to rewire your mindset mm. so there we are going absolutely in recognizing where are we stuck in our mind what is the trauma that holds us back or those limiting beliefs and then work on them and rewire the mindset into a, in a positive way that we know it is a, we are able to move forward and that's mm. my five step system. I love it. Can and were they all ours? Can you repeat them one more time for the podcast? Okay, yes. they're absolutely yes. all yeah. ours. Yes. yes. So it's recognize the root cause, reset the body's healing abilities, repair the root cause, relearn healthy habits and rewire the mindset. And that's ah. my five step food <laughs> freedom formula. Love it. Perfect. Yeah. And all those are great and really key when it comes to not just food and nutrition, but because I think that's one of the pieces that you talked about there too, especially the liver and detoxification and our D and in regards to the liver too, how everything circulates through the liver, right? Those hormones that are going back to the brain, the neurotransmitters communicating about food, all of it. And so it's a, it is a holistic model and I love your five step formula. <laughs> all these F's <laughs> five to the five, the, <laughs> the freedom food formula. <laughs> yeah. I, it's a great way to remember one another R right. Remember things in an easy way. And that's really important when it comes to, like you said, making a new 
habit, having something that's really easy for our brain to rewire. Because if we have something that's really complicated, our brain just really shuts off and says, oh no, wait, <laughs> that's what this, I can't even go there. And I, that's when the patient or client has the complete glaze over their eyes. You're like, you want me to make these changes? What? Yes. I love that you brought up the simple steps Starting with a simple thing, whether it's just, maybe you're just removing one food group from your system. Maybe you're like really addicted to sugar, which we're going to talk about. Maybe, okay, I'm going to start eliminating sugar. Maybe it's not even the whole category because that can be more than a simple step for some people. I have eliminated it myself, and but it, it can sneak in lots of different ways. Yeah. So I love that piece. I love that formula. I love the simplicity, but also the holistic model in addressing all the different pieces of the body. And I liked how you also talked about the food intolerance piece, right? Looking about how your relationship is with your gut, because our gut makes our serotonin. It's so important to have that gut brain relationship firing at all levels. And then we also have our hormones in the gut. There's so many different pieces when it comes to eating. And a lot of people don't even recognize that they have a food sensitivity or food intolerance. And there's, cause there's so many aspects that are involved in it. Absolutely. Most, like you say, most people think it's only when I have some issues with bowel movements or bloating that I have a digestive issues, but food sensitivities or intolerances can show up in your skin. They can mm -hmm. show up as a headache. My migraines, for example, mm -hmm. moodiness, tiredness, whatever it is, there's so many ways. And also to remember, especially when you try to find, maybe if you have a sensitivity, is to remember that it's not necessarily immediately, right? It's right. not like you eat the food and you feel like an allergy, you will normally get the result, whatever it is immediately. It can be two, three days later on feel that. It makes it complicated to work on, but so important. And that is something also maybe to go back a little bit to cravings. That's, the craving part is, I think, the most difficult part often. Mm. And that might be emotional eating, it might be addiction or so. But I work a lot with people who struggle with cravings. Because most people, let's face it, they know they should eat the apple and not the cookie. <laughs> most people know that. The pizza. <laughs> and I'm sure people here know that uh, as well, you are attracting really a great crowd here with your podcast. So they will know this. But in the end, we are not always eating those things. Right? We reach for mm -hmm. the cookie or we overeat on pizza or pasta or whatever it is. And that is really important. And you brought up earlier the neurotransmitters, which are playing a huge role in cravings, mm -hmm. only them. Also the hormones, of course, I mean, your blood sugar, ghrelin, leptin, and all these things work, all these systems work together, right? In the end, by finding the root cause of what triggers your cravings, is it the hormones? Is it maybe that you didn't sleep enough and your melatonin is imbalanced? Is it maybe that your adrenals are overworked and the cortisol affecting the blood sugar is what actually drives your cravings? Maybe it's your gut health is you have too many bad gut bacteria and yeah. because of the serotonin being produced mostly in the gut is it's an issue in you feeling good. So these are the things that are really important. I think when you then address them, and slowly, and you said something really great earlier, is just taking away the sugar or all sugary food is obviously not working for many people. But then <laughs> slowly go back and maybe just cut out the cookie after lunch and replace that with a healthy fruit, something mm. maybe you enjoy. That <laughs> right. is sometimes the way to go. And then slowly go back. And I literally see that I would say 95%, probably even 98%, I don't know, I've never measured it, of my clients crave sweet normally sweet food or carb rich food and after working with me they crave vegetables mm. now i you understand it but probably some listeners here say what she's telling is <laughs> right i can't be whatever. true <laughs> can't be true they're laughing and i have often that reaction obviously when I interact with people who before they work with me or so and I always say okay I'm gonna have the last laugh and I always <laughs> have literally I chuckle then because after a few weeks working with me they say hey you know what actually I'm craving those vegetables right. that's obviously really great Yes. And no, it's a great feeling. You're probably listening out there and you might be one same thing like Andrea was saying and laughing, but it's true. And when your body starts craving the things that one, it really needs and that really supports you, it can make such a 
difference. And that brings me back to the aspect that you were talking about earlier with a detox. So I'd love for us to go back to that because I think that is such an important piece. And how does that relate to food cravings and maybe like inflammation, toxicity in the system? And why is that piece so important in recognizing particular food cravings going on in the body? Great question. I love that one. Now, the food cravings are a lot, like we just explored, related to an imbalance of hormones. There can be a lot of other things, but often hormones play a role, right? Now, the liver is closely related to the hormones. Basically, the hormones are created or, I don't know, do you say created, I think? Mm -hmm. Yes, metabolized. Yes, absolutely. Metabolize. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I was looking for the right word here (laughs) through the liver function. So if the liver is obviously stuck and not functioning properly by being overloaded, either through unhealthy food, by toxins in our environment, for example, as well, the liver just cannot metabolize anymore so well the hormones. And that obviously has then an effect on the cravings. And as well, because the liver working closely together with the gut and the neurotransmitter as well. So there is an imbalance and very often then the dopamine levels, the serotonin levels can be imbalanced as Mm -hmm. well. And that is why the detox of the liver is really so important just to keep things flowing and of course allow your hormones to be balanced as a result of it, which helps a lot. The other thing that I also find interesting is that toxins are fat soluble and because they're fat soluble, they hold on to the fat cells and Often through the detoxification process, when you do it right, and I always use a step detoxification process, transforming the fat-soluble toxins into water-soluble, so eventually they can be eliminated through the body, is when initially they are holding on to the fat and lose the fat because they're holding on to it. And that's also something which is often very important in weight loss to understand. So together in terms of cravings and of course we can go further on with the whole blood sugar and insulin it's there which is hugely as well of course playing a role in cravings and the whole uh, metabolism which then often of course if left alone and unattended let's say can then lead of course to insulin resistance eventually Mm. diabetes and other chronic illnesses yeah so key and i think the liver is the one organ that's just not talked about enough Mm -hmm. it's so important and i'm always talking about the liver and its roles with my patients, especially from the hormonal perspective, because our liver helps us to make hormones, <laughs> right? And it's, it has so many roles and it's one of our biggest circulata- circulatory organs, right? Because all of that blood circulates through the liver, through the hepatocytes and goes right back to our heart. So if we're not having a great liver, we're going to have a poor heart system. We can have chronic heart failure, CHF. It's huge. It's so important. And it doesn't get enough love. Yeah. We need TLC, right? <laughs> yeah, for the liver. Yeah. And even right. kidneys, how, mm-hmm. how close they're linked to the liver is just everything. I agree so much. So that's really why I think a regular detoxification process is important. And I just want to say it depends obviously on everybody. Not everybody can do a detox like mm-hmm. for example, when you're maybe pregnant. Not a good idea. A, you know, <laughs> so I just want to say that. Yes. So always check these Thank things you. with your mm-hmm. doctor. But also it depends very much what type of detox or cleanse or whatever right. it is called. Because I've seen so many, and Dr. Lulo, I'm sure you too, so many cleanses, the juice cleanse or the water cleanse or the whatever detox. And most, many of them, not most, but many of them are outright dangerous or actually not helping they might maybe do something but often you then end up once you transform those those toxins the fat soluble toxins into water soluble toxins if then you don't eliminate them you have them flying around as or swimming <laughs> around as flea, flea sorry free radicals exactly. and that can even then be dangerous and that's why by the way many people have actually issues so it's very important also to have a very healthy detoxification process 
illnesses. Yeah, that's a great point that you brought up. It's so important to research, but if you're not working with someone like myself or Andrea, that you're researching all the aspects of a detox and the detox that I work with patients is they, the result is that they love it. And that's how you should feel after you do a detox. It shouldn't have been a torturous experience that made you feel worse. Now that's not being said uh, in the first couple of days, you're going to have some off gassing, right? Like your, as your body is shifting, maybe to those food cravings, <laughs> your body, you're giving them something new to eat. And so your body might be a little mad in the beginning, right? Whether you're going to have more of a headache or something like that, but it's very important. I love that you brought that up. Yes. It listen, research or reach out to either one of us to help guide you with that. And another piece I wanted to ask you. So we're talking about the food craving piece and it sounds like from what you have already talked about that most of the food cravings come from a different aspects of our body. And do you find that it's like emotional and physiological, both of them together? Like how's that relationship work? Or is it a balance of everything together? Or can someone just have just emotional food cravings? Is, am I, is it, that question clear? <laughs> It is absolutely clear. And in general, I have found it's always a full aspect of or multiple things that are going on, right? Yeah. And sometimes they're led also, one thing led to the other. So there might be, and I always ask my clients whenever they have maybe an illness that started or they have a sudden weight gain or mm -hmm. whatever it is, I always ask them, what happened at the same time or before exactly. around that time what mm -hmm. else happened in your life and usually there's a trauma or something happens or perhaps acute stress or something that kind of triggered it off mm -hmm. led to the illness or whatever it is so the thing is then often let's say there's a trauma we start eating and then of course through the unhealthy eating we change our gut bacteria, our gut lining changes a lot. And just when we eat processed food, it affects so much our gut lining, actually. And there's amazing research that is done that we can even not cope with it. We cannot absorb anymore anything mm -hmm. because through the processed food, the gut lining is blocked almost. Yeah. And so we just eat more and more. So obviously <laughs> these things then re lead to craving. So you can say, okay, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? So <laughs> yes. in the end, it's one thing leads to the other. So I would say in general, it's a multi multiple uh, aspect there that plays yeah. a role. Yes, I think that's, yes, so key, so perfect, because it is true, right? It's not that one over the other, like you said, not the chicken or the egg, but that feed, almost like a feedback loop, right? One feeding the other for the emotional and the psychological back and forth. And what about, let's talk about blood sugar, because we've talked a little bit about it, but I'd like us to dive in, it because I think that is I don't know if it's the biggest <laughs> aspect of what people are dealing with, but I think it's really high up there. So how is the blood sugar balance really related to food cravings? That is a wonderful question. And I'm also passionate about blood sugar because <laughs> it's, again, going back to all the hormone balance we, we discussed, but basically what I see happening with people who are eating an unhealthy diet. And what I say with unhealthy diet is usually the macros are not balanced, mm. right? And when I say that there is no one size fits all, it should be 30% of this, 20% of that or whatever. But there's a little bit an overarching that many people and especially in the standard American diet, there is too much carbohydrates, right? 90% carbs. <laughs> you, you said it, right? It is absolutely and usually not enough protein and healthy fats. So there's definitely an imbalance and additional most of what the macros consist of are nutrient poor components, processed foods. So of course, when you look at this affects hugely the blood sugar, because in the end, if you start your morning with cereals, a bagel, your coffee with <laughs> sugar, and, Donut. um, I don't know, donuts, and whatever it is, right. basically your blood sugar goes up through the roof, right? And yep. you feel sunny whatever, super hyper and whatever, mm -hmm. eventually the blood sugar a little bit later, and that's normally your 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock in the morning, crashes down. And that's normally when you get tired and you get moody and maybe you have a little bit of stress. And what happens? You open the drawer in your office or you go to your fridge or whatever it is, and you get a pick me up. And that's maybe another right. bagel or mm -hmm. whatever Coffee, it is, right? Or Starbucks or something. <laughs> and then it goes up again. And then at lunchtime, maybe, you know, you're at lunchtime, 
and you have some pizza or pasta or whatever and then you crash down in the afternoon and so it goes basically up and down throughout the day and that is super unhealthy and that mm -hmm. is what affects the cravings because of course each time the blood sugar is down is when you crave something to exactly. get the pick me up and this this kind of cycle up and down is obviously one makes you craving more and two is really unhealthy because mm. eventually that is something that can lead to insulin resistance yeah. and to hyperglycemia and so on. And of course, then further down to issues around co high cholesterol or heart issues, hormonal issues around that and so on. Yeah. So it sounds like blood sugar is, plays a huge role <laughs> in our cravings. And also you were, I uh, liked how you laid out the timeline, right? Because I think so many people have this, like they need to have that go-to pick me up that once you mentioned or you're getting up in the morning and you're trying to get through your day and you're like, okay, the only way that I know, quote unquote, no, to get through my day is if I have that candy bar or if I have that extra cup of coffee. And that's really bad, like you said, for the gut, the hormones, especially the adrenal system that balances our blood sugar. It, and if we're in high states of stress and our cortisol levels are mm -hmm. through the roof and then the adrenals are trying to balance our blood sugar, it really makes you feel so much worse. And I love that you brought that up. And when we're in that place of crashing, right, what are some of those specific foods that you recommend to replace those quote unquote bad pick me ups that are really going to help them balance those food cra cravings and make us feel more stable? Absolutely. So now we are absolutely talking here. I love to discuss that. So first of all, I'm far more about prevention, right? Mm. So what I recommend is you don't want to get there because once you're there, you're in this vicious cycle, it's more difficult to get right, out. Yes. So what I recommend <laughs> is actually to start your day much better than with the bagels and whatever you eat in the morning. The And Remember also cereals are, even if they say healthy, they're usually not that healthy. That's right. So <laughs> what I really recommend is really having a, a protein and fiber rich breakfast with almost or no carbs, actually. So mal or no carbs. And for example, what I really like and what I do in the morning is I have a really healthy smooth. In that smooth, I put my protein powder in. I have some almond milk in there. I put a little bit of fruits because I like the taste. Not too many, though. And I put <laughs> some uh, spinach that gives me the fiber, additional fiber. You don't taste it, actually. And usually a little bit of booster. I normally have a bit of maca powder, some flaxseed, whatever it is. And I make it always a bit different with whatever food I have there and make it interesting. And that is something it keeps me going throughout the morning. I normally I really have a great energy throughout the day. I have seen even at one stage I was staying somewhere else and I ate oats, which is healthy, right? Mm -hmm. So not unhealthy. But when I ate those oats, I had to do a nap every afternoon. Mm -hmm. I was so tired. So right. with my smoothie, I keep up. So that gives me the protein and the fiber in there with a little bit of healthy fat, basically helps me to keep my blood sugar stable without depending on carbs right in between if i need a little snack i have maybe a half handful of almonds or a little bit of fruit or maybe some carrot sticks or carrot sticks with hummus that's more my afternoon snack or so <laughs> and then for my lunch actually i have i love salad and so mm. i have my salad and i make always something different and i always make sure i have enough protein in there so it can be tuna or salmon or maybe chicken or some beans or so and then in the evening i there it's actually not too bad to have a little bit of carbs because I don't say that you should keep carbs out completely. Right. <laughs> and you can also have some carbs at lunch, but it should just not be the whole, the whole part. Like a it. sandwich with like um, the bread this thick or something. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So in the evening, for example, it's a great idea to have maybe some stir fry chicken with some vegetable and maybe brown rice or quinoa or something like that. It's mm -hmm. actually the carbs make you tired. They kind of work on your uh, serotonin levels and make you actually a little bit like more relaxed so you yeah. want to have this evening so it's actually a good idea so yeah. that's the way how I keep my blood sugar stable and that's really works well yeah that's great that's how I eat too <laughs> of course like mine's yes and so important and for me when I was growing up too I had during my teenage years I was hypoglycemic probably because of hormones and, and who knows all the different pieces but um 
I would eat frequently right throughout the day. And I still have that same type of thing because I know that if I don't, my blood sugar will drop. And so for me, just like you said, having healthy snacks, whether that's a little protein, I love like apple with almond butter or some kind of a little bit of hummus, like you said, in the afternoon, something to really satiate you. And that's another piece that we, I'd love for us to talk about too. Are those some of those same foods that you talked about are those great for satiety, helping with those food cravings, because I think that's a piece of like, well, I just ate lunch and now I just want to have a whole candy bar right after. (laughs) Absolutely not a help. As I said, I go really through my day. I don't have cravings. I don't have any blood sugar that goes down or so on. My blood sugar goes down very quickly if I don't eat, by the way. I get hangry, actually. My husband knows that very well. I (laughs) normally pay super attention. If I go out, I always have, first of all, I always have water. And by the way, that's also one thing that's important. Mm -hmm. We actually think we are hungry, but we are actually thirsty. So that's something we haven't talked about too much. Some of these little things are all adding up and making yeah. sure that when I go out, I have water and I have always a bag of nuts with me <laughs> because they are a safe thing to carry around. And even if I forget them, they're okay there. And that's really great. And like this, that's a really good thing for people who are on the road all the time. A lot mm. of my clients are, and many people are to just always make sure you plan something in advance. That's maybe also another tip that's really important is yeah, food preparation, planning in advance and all these things, of course, I'm teaching because often when we come home or when we are on the road or so, and we don't have time and we haven't planned some healthy option is then when we go to eat something unhealthy we either right. crave it or it's often even not that we crave it but it's the first option available because if you look at it fast food is usually the thing that is fast right you grab it <laughs> grab and go like the bars right. or whatever the cookies you just grab it but if you have actually a healthy option available too you would grab it equally yes oh that's great i love that go to snacks Yes, I my, my purse always has go-to snacks. <laughs> and we didn't we don't have lots of time to talk about go-to snacks today because we're wrapping up, but you do want to read those labels if you're going to have a protein bar that you're buying at the store, make sure the first ingredient is not sugar. <laughs> and how much is that sugar content? It's so important. Like I, I love to read labels, and when I go to the protein bar section it's always like hundreds. I can't believe there's all so many protein bars. And I love reading them. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> I can't believe somebody's buying this. I should make a, a little reel and go to the, the store and talk about protein bars because there's so many ones that are just awful, but there's ones that are also really great too. <laughs> Fortunately, it's changing a little bit, but I agree. What you can do as a rule of thumb is also look at the amount of of ingredients there. Ideally, of course, you want to have something that has no list, right? Piece of fruit or whatever. (laughs) But at least stick to not having more than five ingredients in it and make sure the first one or even other ingredients are not sugar. And also remember that sometimes sugar is called something else than sugar. So Mm. just pay attention to that. And I agree. (laughs) I am so passionate. I always tell my clients when I ask them what they eat, like which protein powder they use, which, which bar do they use? I ask them to send me the picture and then usually I give them feedback. (laughs) Circle the things. uh, Yeah. And that's another big one. Yeah. Protein shakes and protein powders. You definitely want to be reading those labels for sure. Lots of hidden ingredients, especially in the US. I think we could talk for such a long time, Andrea, but I'm so happy that you came on today. And as we're wrapping up, I'd love to have one more fun question for you. And then we're going to talk about your wonderful promotion and your freebie, which are so great. Let's first just talk about how people can find you or your website and how people can follow you on social media. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So my website is wellnessmethods.com. So pretty easy. And I'm sure you're sharing that somewhere here in the notes. Yes. Then I am on Facebook. I'm on Instagram with wellness methods as the handle. I'm also on Pinterest, actually, and I'm on YouTube. So you can <laughs> find me all over there. I'm sure Google is your friend. Find me and you have, of course, the links here. Yes. Wonderful. I love it. Yes. We'll make it really easy for everyone listening to find. You can look in the show notes and follow Andrea. Sorry, Andrea at wellnessmethods.com and all over the social media platforms. And so one last question today, and we're going to talk about your promotion and your freebie. If you had an unlimited budget right now, what would you do with that money or abundance to make the biggest impact on the health and welfare of our planet? 
Oh my goodness, that's an interesting question, actually. I look, I think what I'm doing already is growing my business and helping more people. So I think I do that work. And that was actually <laughs> what drove me to start my business is help people. So if I have an abundance of money, I would probably grow my business more so I can reach more. Yeah. And I would speak more on bigger stages to reach more people. I already have, I have some coaches working with me. I'm mentoring other coaches. So actually spending my time helping other people to help other people is one time one thing I do as well and definitely if I would have a lot of money I would definitely then invest in allowing people and I have traveled a lot in my life so I would definitely also look at other poor communities around the globe to allow them to have access to healthy food on one hand but also have the education I think it's missing maybe that would be something is the education system I think is missing this education around food about around health mm -hmm. if you look at your children at yourself right how much time do you spend in school to learn cooking and learning cooking zero and <laughs> learning stress <laughs> management technique and meditation and how to sleep healthy and how to take care and the importance of self-care the importance of being you right not being right. bullied at school all this and I think I would invest in that probably that would be if I really want to go big yes I love it thinking yeah I know <laughs> it's a really great question because it love makes people really expand their vessel of manifestation and I love that and so many people have that education piece with children when I'm asked when I ask that question and when it comes to food hands down it needs to be shifted and changed in our environment and I like that you brought up the all of the mindset piece too right teaching our children about meditation, yoga. And I went to school in Montessori school when I was a kid, we learned all those things. We cooked in the classroom. We learned about food. We learned about meditation and yoga, which is probably why I still practice it and love it. And it makes me so happy. And so, yeah, the thing, you got that one. That's a great one. And I love it. It's so important. Love that. I love the question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So tell us about your amazing food freedom blueprint consultation that you're offering for our listeners. Oh, great. Yes, I would love that. So I have a special gift for you guys. And there will be some limit. So you <laughs> rather be quick on that one. I've only that much space in my calendar. But I want to give my free time to you and offer you this food freedom consultation where basically, I want to personalize the experience. I shared a lot of tips today and a lot of things that are important, like my food freedom formula, but I want to personalize that. So basically, obviously find out a bit more about you and help you to find out what you're struggling with, what your goals are, and really put together an action plan on how to get to your goals. They might be health goals, they might be weight loss goals, it's just to overcome cravings or whatever they are. And that's basically my food freedom consultation that I'm offering here. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And we'll put that link in the show notes as well. And tell us about your quit sugar cravings workbook, your freebie that you're offering to our listeners too. I love this one. Okay, that is actually a workbook that we've just reworked and it's really complete. It's several pages actually and really nice because it has one really teaching you how to where sugar hides. So we talked about the labels. So for example, there's a list of where the sugar hides, what to pay attention to, the dangers of sugar. And then there's especially for cravings. What we talked about is how to how you feel about food or how food, food makes you feel. So paying attention a little bit more being a little bit mindful about what you eat and how that makes you feel and also making changes using or implementing new habits or so so there's a day a diary in there that you can follow as well it gives you some prompts there's also some stress eating tips so when you have normally the stress eating what else can you do so there's a full <laughs> list of plenty of things that you can start doing instead of reaching for the cookie. And then a big section there is actually, and you will love that because we talked about it, <laughs> is how certain type of foods and supplements can actually help you overcome the cravings. Now, cravings or overcoming them is a journey. It's not going to happen overnight. Mm. And we all know it's not an easy thing, but you can make it easier. We talked earlier about just drinking the smoothie in the morning instead of having too many carbs. So there are other foods that actually make it easier to overcome cravings. So eventually you get your body to crave vegetables, right? Not anymore 
whatever the cookies were. <laughs> and there are, it's a really long food list. And I tell you obviously a little bit more about it and some supplements that help you actually to make the journey easier. That's my sugar craving workbook. It's really great. I love it. I put all my love in and it's basically <laughs> what normally I share only with my clients and you get that. Wonderful. Oh, I, I love that. Thank you so much. So needed for people to help with balancing their sugar daily and in their life. Put that link as well. Thanks again so much, Andrea, for coming today. I so loved our conversation and I can't wait to share it with everyone. Oh, Dr. Lulu, it was amazing. Already I loved our conversation, but now the <laughs> other way around. It's really great being your guest and I'm so happy to be there. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you for everybody for listening. Thank you.